Okay, Dr. Rasha, you can go ahead. Okay, hello, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining uh, into our webinar, um, peritonitis webinar. It's the first of, uh, of its type. It's a, co a collaboration between um, two committees of the AFRAN, the Peritoneal Dialysis Committee and the Education Committee. And so Professor Nicola Wayne from South Africa did a great job uh, working on it, and we cooperated to try to um, give birth to this uh, scientific activity with some of the most eminent nephrologists uh, from African continent. And we're hoping that you're going to all be able to enjoy it, benefit from it. And if you have any questions following uh, the talks, we can allow following each talk and, uh, about two to three questions or a five minutes discussion following uh, the presentations. Thank you all. Let me present our first speaker. Our first speaker is Professor Abdun Young, uh, a dear uh, friend and colleague. Of course, we all know that Professor Abdu uh, was the former president of the Afran and current secretary general of the Afran. He has many uh, activities and he is occupying many uh, eminent posts. He is the professor in the University and Faculty of Medicine in Dakar, Senegal. He's the head of the nephrology department there. He's the co-chair of the Internal Society of Peritoneal Dialysis, African chapter, and the chair of the Dialysis Working Group of Internal, International Society of Nephrology. Today, Professor Abdu will talk about a very important topic about PD in Africa, what is the current status? Professor Abdu, waiting for you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rasha, for your keen introduction. And I would like uh, first to thank uh, the education uh, and uh, the PD committee for, for this uh, very nice initiative. And I think uh, we'll uh, enjoy many, many webinars during uh, this year. And uh, it's my pleasure to talk about uh, the PD in Africa. And uh, this is my outline. Instead, renal disease in, in the world is a very huge uh, problem. If we count more than uh, 80, 100 million people suffering for kidney disease. And if you look this slide, we have uh, more people suffering kidney disease than diabetes mellitus, than cancer and HIV. And uh, we noted that in uh, kidney disease is the 11th uh, leading cause of global mortality in the world. And uh, more than 2 million people are living under dialysis. But you note that more than two to seven million of people did not have access to dialysis treatment. It's that uh, for acute kidney injury, we have more than 13 million people who are suffering of this disease. And uh, you know that the kidney disease treatment is very expensive. It's uh, between uh, 35 to 100,000. Dollars, and it will be a very huge problem for the low and middle income countries. Kidney disease is a, a public health problem in the continent and in the world in general. And 90% of world dialysis patients are coming from the developing world, North America, Europe, and Japan. And if you see in that slide, in 2010, you have uh, 2.6 million of people under dialysis in the world, with more than 9 million of people who normally uh, need dialysis but did not have access. And if uh, we are going in the same way in 2030, we will have more than 10 million of people who will need dialysis, but did not have access to the kidney replacement therapy. And uh, if you see 
on that slide, most of people, uh, the number of patients receiving kidney renal replacement therapy are living in uh, Asia, in North America, in Europe. And if you see in Africa and in Oceania, we have a very low rate of people receiving kidney renal re replacement therapy. And I think in depending on uh, the power of the country, and if you see on my right, the low and the lower middle income countries count less than 10% of people living with renal replacement therapy in the world. And uh, the number of patients receiving renal replacement therapy have an increasing trend in the world. And you see here, but uh, the number of patients will be increased in Asia and in the developing country, in the developed country. And as you see here in Africa, the trend is stable during that time. You know, this continent, very huge, more than 30 million of square kilometers with 55 countries and uh, more than 1.3 billion population. And the increasing trend in end-stage renal disease prevalence in sub-Saharan countries uh, continue to progress over than 150%. And uh, in that uh, study about uh, the burden of end-stage renal disease in sub-Saharan uh, Africa, we made a systematic re review in the Lance Global Health in 2017. And we noted that in sub-Saharan Africa, 96% of adults and 95% of children who could not access to dialysis will die. And you have 84% of adults in incident in stage renal disease called discontinued dialysis uh, because many times it's the problem because they pay out of pocket. And if you see the different modalities in that slide, hemodialysis in the main modalities in Africa. You have in some country, some patient on PD, like uh, in South Africa, here in Senegal or in Democratic Republic of Congo. But uh, for transplantation, kidney transplantation, it's very low. As you see here, you have uh, some patient, less than 30% in Sudan, in Nigeria, in Libya, in South Africa, in Algeria. And in that uh, ISN Africa survey done in uh, 2014, we note that the prevalence of uh, hemodialysis patient is depending on the power of these different African countries. And you noted that we have more than 200 per million population in the Northern Africa. Here you have in Mauritania, in Algeria, Morocco. Egypt, Libya, and Tunisia, and in Morris. But out of them, all the sub-Saharan country, countries have less than 200 million per population. And uh, we noted that a very great disparities in Africa. For example, here, around 80% 80, 80 of uh, dialysis population are living in Northern Africa. And you have around 6% in Western Africa. And uh, here in Austral Africa, you have uh, 80%. And the medium prevalence is uh, 116 per million population. But as I noted, most of them are living in Northern Africa. And in Northern Africa also, you have the most prevalence in Tunisia, 
and after followed by Libya, Egypt, Morocco, Algeria, and Mauritania. About dialysis accessibility, as you know here in uh, Cameroon, in Mali, in Tunisia, they report around 100 person. But sometime in that country, you can have a good accessibility, but uh, the patient don't receive enough uh, dialysis session. And uh, in that part, as you see in uh, Nigeria or Ethiopia, you have a very low dialysis accessibility. As in my country, in Senegal, less than 50% of uh, patients who needed dialysis have access to the treatment. And what about the survival on dialysis? Uh, related to the study reported in Nigeria by uh, Fatiu Aragundane, we noted that most of the patient and uh, incidents in dialysis will die in the first uh, six months of treatment because most of these patients are paying, uh, paid for uh, out of pocket. And what about the funding resource? You have in some country, for example, uh, in Ethiopia or in Nigeria, the patient, most of the patients are paid out of pocket. The government support dialysis in, in Niger, in Malawi, in Chad, in Sudan, Cameroon, Mauritania. And you see uh, the medical insurance is well developed in some countries in the Northern Africa. What about nephrologists in the, 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 in the, in the continent? In the continent, you have less than two nephrologists per million population. And uh, here in the high income countries, you can have around 30 nephrologists per million comparatively to low income countries where you have 0 0.3 nephrologists per million population. And uh, in Africa, as you noted here, the mean is around 3.64. But uh, you have a great variability in the continent. For example, uh, in sub-Saharan country, you have less than two nephrologists per million population. And when you go in the northern part of the continent, you have between seven to 12 nephrologists per million population. It's, uh, that's why we have a great challenge on training nephrologists in different countries uh, in Africa. For example, in, in Senegal, since 2008 to 2020, we have trained 140 nephrologists from 19 countries in Africa, mainly for French speaking country. They came from uh, the Northern country, Africa, Morocco or Tunisia in West Africa mainly, but in Central Africa and from East Africa. Here we have the repetition of these different nephrologists trained in Senegal. What about prevalence of PD in Africa? For IKI, peritoneal dialysis was used to treat patients with IKI, sponsored by Saving Young Life Experience in West Africa. And it was a great experience supported by uh, different uh, organization. And now Brett Collis is chairing this very important uh, initiative in ISN. It's a preliminary report. We see that uh, around 200 patients was treated, mainly young boys. The mean age was around five mainly 26 in Bingo, in Cameroon. And we see in that study that it was a very interesting study with a mortality rate about 30% in that different experience. 
enforce end stage renal disease. The prevalence of PD in the global dialysis population is around 11%. But as we noted, we have a low prevalence in Africa for PD population. What about the PD prevalence in the world? Here in the developed nation, we have uh, around 60% of uh, the global population of PD in the world. And you see that uh, in the developing country, the number of patients living on PD still below. And if you see that different countries, the number of patients uh, living on PD, the, the first is in Mexico, followed by USA and China. But if you see the prevalence per million population, you have Hong Kong on the top, followed by Mexico and Salvador. And what about Africa? The, the, dialysis, the African dialysis population is a 4.5% of global dialysis population. And the prevalence is around 74 per million population. And PD in, North, in Northern Africa count around 83% of African dialysis population. But here PD account only for zero, zero to three percent of the African dialysis population in Northern Africa. And if you look at the prevalence of a PD patient in the Northern Africa, in Algeria, you have around 900 patients living on PD in Tunisia, we have more than 300, and in Morocco, more than 200 patients. And uh, the majority of patients treated by PD in Sub-Saharan Africa live in South Africa. You have more than 1,000 patients living under PD. If related to that report of the South African Renal Registry, but we have some some growing PD program in uh, Sudan or in Senegal. But you see that in many countries in Africa, you have some cohorts and some patients uh, under PD. PD was not available in most countries in Africa. What about the different experience? In South Africa, you have more than 1,300 patients. And in Sudan, you have more than 100 patients. And in Senegal, you have more than 600 patients. What about the PD program in South Africa since uh, 1987? We have uh, more than 150 nephrologists in South Africa and uh, a very interesting court on PD, but uh, this court is only 14% uh, of PD dialysis population in the country. The PD program of Sudan was built in 2005. You have around 20 nephrologists in the country and 100 patients on PD. It's account about 3% of PD dialysis population and only CAPD is available in uh, Sudan. What about uh, the situation in Senegal? In Senegal, in that report we have done in Kidnet 360 in 2020, you have uh, 28 uh, nephrologists with more than 1,000 patients on dialysis, but PD just account around 4% of dialysis population. And uh, we, we reported the, this experience in Senegal with PD for instead renal disease. The, the experience in Senegal began in 2004 to 2020. 
And at the beginning of the experience, it was very it was very expensive for the patient because it was at what what thousand euro per month. But uh, from June 2012, after a very good advocacy, the government accepted the subsidy PD, and it's become free of charge for patients in the public sector. And the experience began with uh, Baxter. And uh, in 2007, Fresenius Medical Care was introduced in the country. And it's that first experience we reported about 130 patients who were on dialysis, on PD, with 62 patients who was analyzed in that study. You see the mean age of the patient is still very young, 47 years. And the majority came from the capital. And uh, the duration of patient training was around two to seven days. And in the study, 50% of patients were paid by the family and out of pocket. The peritonis, peritonitis rate was uh, one episode uh, 0 0.6 episode per year, and uh, around 40% had no episode of peritonitis. Touch contamination was the most frequent cause. And uh, at the beginning of the experience also, we have many bacterial cultures were negative. Uh, Staphylococcus aureus and Pseudomonas were most common bacteria discovered in our experience. And 12 patients changed to hemodialysis and 16 patients died with uh, 54 patients still, were still maintained on PD at the end of the study. Uh, the challenge and barrier to the growth of PD in Senegal was the late referral of end stage renal disease patients. A large proportion of the population live in the rural setting with limited access to dialysis facilities. And we have also a high occupant to bedroom ratio, no electricity, no water supply, supply and were significantly associated with peritonitis rates and informal housing. We have a high rate of infection was a very bad publicity for PD with patients and practitioners. And lack of facilities for proper culture technique leads to an unacceptably high rate of culture negative peritonitis. What about the challenge and possible solution in the continent? In the study in Nigeria, we have uh, some different problems most encountered with PD experience, like financial constraints, inadequate flood, flood supply, frequent line blockage, frequent infection, and frequent fluid leakage. And uh, when PD was first used, the reason to stop PD was mainly the lack of PD catheter, the lack of PD fluids, the lack of expert personnel, and sometimes the lack of satisfactory results. And you see these different conditions, the higher cost and unavailability of PD fluid, the higher rate of peritonitis and catheter-related infection, sometimes unavailability of PD catheter, the low reimbursement of physician and patient unwillingness was the most challenges of PD use in the continent. And it's very important to solve this different uh, problem by for example, building domestic manufacture for PD fluid, for training health professional, and some physician incentive reimbursements, and to develop the public private partnership and health insurance, and the patient education and standard of living improvement can help to develop PD in the continent. Uh, chairman, for conclusion, I would like to emphasize that PD is a sweat table therapy, which may be widely used for instead renal disease treatment in Africa. Challenges to the development of PD program include 
the training healthcare providers, developing an infrastructure to support the program and developing a cost structure which permit expansion of the PD program. PD should be developed as a part of an integrated kidney renal replacement system with HD, kidney transplantation, and conservative kidney management. And public provision of dialysis should prioritize PD over HD. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Abdul, for this uh, very interesting, detailed, and uh, informative uh, talk. I mean, you did highlight how big the problem and the issue of PD in our continent. And let's hope with this, um, this flow of information and uh, the teamwork that somehow might play a role in um, overcoming the obstacles of PD in Africa. Thank you so much, Professor Abdul. Um, I didn't see any questions sent on the chat uh, of the presentation. Maybe if anyone has questions, uh, either they could uh, send them now or we could postpone them at the end of our uh, presentations. Okay, thank you um, so much. Yes. I, have, I have a question, if that's okay. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, I, I, it's something that I know we're all quite, um, being all quite thoughtful about, but I know we've got such a, a, a small number of nephrologists per, uh, per in, in Africa. Um, uh, Abdu, what are your thoughts about how to advocate for increasing numbers? I know we're all struggling with that, but what do you advise or what are your, how do you feel that we should be moving forward to try to increase the nephrology numbers? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Nikki, for this question. Very, very important challenge. Uh, the first thing uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, the nephrologists must uh, make uh, this specially more uh, uh, attractable eh? because uh, when you uh, discuss with a student in the university, usually they, they find that nephrology is so difficult, but I think it's just impression, but we need uh, more advocacy uh, from the nephrologists. And uh, I think uh, something interesting is also to have some experience about the transfer of technology. Uh, it will be very important if the, in the future, we've, if we can build a capacity uh, with some physician or some uh, nurse uh, to, to transfer some, some, some capacity to help train, uh, treating the patient because I, I, I know some country in the continent who are trying to, uh, to do that. But uh, in Canada, I, I, I think that uh, uh, they, they do this, this experience. Because at the rhythm where we are going now, I'm afraid that in 20 years, we continue to, uh, to, to quantify the number of nephrologists to be less than uh, five per million. And I think it's a dramatic situation. Yes, I agree, Abdul, but I think this is a global problem. I think the, the decreasing number of nephrologists is not just an African problem. I believe it's a global problem. So uh, this has to be uh, approached by, on a wider scale, I believe. Brett, okay. Brett, Brett want to... Yes. I just, I, yeah, I'd just like to, to comment on that. So you're right. I think that the only way that we're going to increase the numbers of patients on, on PD is to, is to share them with other people. So we set up a, a nurse-led PD service in South Africa, um, which was run entirely by a nurse for six months. It now has doctors involved, but um, was run by a nurse. She had peritonitis rates better than what they, they were in the UK. Um, and certainly, as, as you say, uh, Prof Nyang, you know, in Canada, do it in the UK, PD is run by nurses. It's not, it's not run by doctors. So if you're going to be setting up a PD program, you need to train the nurses because they're the ones that are going to run it. Um, and, and certainly you don't need a lot of nephrologists to look after it. In places like um, China and Colombia, there's a lot of 
um, this idea of a wagon wheel approach where you have a central unit and then people in the outlying areas who are not necessarily nephrologists or, or nurses um, look after the patients and they've got a, a reference center in the in the middle who they can they can you know, discuss patients with or send the patients through if they have complications. So I do, I think we, we, we probably are never gonna have enough nephrologists, um, not in the time frame that we need. So we do have to think laterally. Excellent. Thank you, Brett, for this addition. I think it's a very smart one that focusing on what we have in our hands, which is actually training the nurses, could be the solution for PD in Africa. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe I will, I will use uh, your, um, your talk just to introduce you for your next uh, presentation. Um, now we're having Professor Brett Coolis. I mean, I'm sure that almost most of us know him very well. Uh, Professor Brett, he performed his undergraduate training at the University of Cape Town. Uh, he traveled then to the UK and performed nephrology and intensive care uh, training at the Royal Devon and Exeter, Plymouth, and Bristol Children's Hospital. Uh, he currently works as a nephrologist and intensive care specialist in um, Peter Mazritsburg and is an, an honorary senior lecturer at the University of Cape Town. Uh, Professor Brett has many publications uh, in PD International, PD International, seminars in nephrology and American Journal of mm -hmm. Transportation, as well as he, read, he did write uh, chapters for books mm -hmm and is on the editorial board of the Peritoneal Dialysis International. He's also as well a co-author of the ISPD Access Guidelines 2019, and is the chair of the ISPD guideline for the PD in AKI 2015 and 2020. His current interests are intensive care nephrology, PD, which is why we're having him today with us for specially acute kidney injury and treatment for, of AKI in low and middle income countries, and is the chair of the ISN, ISPD, IPNA, and EuroPD Saving Young Lives Steering Committee, and did help us a lot during the last conference um, in Côte d'Ivoire to sponsor uh, the translation to French uh, for most of our um, uh, talks in the conference. Right now, he sits on the ISN Dialysis work, Working Group, the ISN, WHO, AKI, and Dialysis Toolkit Development Group, ISN Core Programs Committee, and is on the ISPD Council. A very uh, rich resume, Professor Brett. Today, why, what he's gonna talk about, he's gonna talk about why PD is a modality, what are the advantages, and what fluid options are available. Thank you, Professor Brett. Thanks very much, Dr. Darwish, and um, thanks very much, Prof. Nyang, for um, actually setting the scene for my talk because I think it's a fantastic, it was a fantastic talk, and and really set the scene of, of why why we should be looking at PD in Africa and what can we do to to improve uptake. I think this is this is also very important. Um, if you ask patients and you educate them properly, around forty five to fifty five percent of patients. Would actually choose to do PD. Certainly they'd choose a home dialysis modality um, if they have the option. Most of these studies taken from, from countries in, in high income countries, um, but certainly people want to do PD. If you ask nephrologists what they would rather do, 90% of them would choose to do a home therapy. Um, and of that, there's a split of about 50-50 doing home hemo or home PD. So if if we as nephrologists would want to do PD, 50% of us, um, and patients want to do it in 50% of cases, why is it that we have around about three or 5% of patients only on PD? So this is a, a document which is freely available on the internet, and I urge you to read it. It's, uh, it's very helpful if you are setting up dialysis programs, and it was put together by the ISN in collaboration with the WHO. And, and we tried to put together a framework for trying to develop um, dialysis programs in low resource settings. And you'll see in the, um, in the executive summary um, just taken here that the ISN recommends that in, in health systems with low resource settings that we should prioritize setting up PD services over HD services. And I'm gonna go through why, why we really think we should be doing this. So this is just a, a slide of, of PD prevalence and, and Abdu did go through all of this, but you can see that between 
0.03 per million population and 3,000 per million population of patients are on PD. And there is this, this huge spread. And where, why, why is there such a spread? Well, one of the big things is that PD is quite prevalent, you can see in those countries that have a national health insurance. And this is because PD is generally offered um, to patients as an option because it's felt to be as good as hemodialysis. So, so patients tend to be given, given the choice. Um, and certainly in many of these countries, it's cheaper to be doing PD than it is to be doing hemodialysis. Whereas in those countries that are funded by a private healthcare system, the numbers tend to be a lot lower. And then if you look down in the, in the countries that have uh, very little um, in the way of finances um, as a whole, so low income countries, PD is not very prevalent. What's happening over time? Well, you can see that between 1997 and 2007, the number of patients on PD does tend to be falling. Um, it's falling faster in developed countries, um, but is falling in developing countries as well. But there has been a change recently, and this is looking at the, at the US, um, and there's more recent data than this slide um, showing that this, is, this trend's continued. But you can see that the number of patients on home dialysis has been going up. And what's happened is that between 2008 and to current, the number of patients on PD has been going up significantly. And why is this the case? Well, it's because the US have changed their system of remuneration and patients get a, a they, they pay per patient on dialysis rather than paying for um, sessions on hemodialysis, paying extra for if the patients need intravenous iron, et cetera. So it's suddenly it's become more cost effective for patients to be on PD and the number of patients has gone up. What's happening in South Africa? Again, Abdi's gone through this, but um, just looking at a paper from Ivor Katz, uh, it's quite an old paper now, but you can see here, the number of patients on hemodialysis has doubled between 2002, 2008, but the number of patients on peritoneal dialysis hardly changed at all. And if you look at the split in South Africa between public and private, you can see in the public sector, 27.8% um, of patients are on PD, whereas only 6% in the private sector are on PD. And this is a major problem. There should be equity across the board. So what are the barriers to PD in Africa? Skilled nursing, very important. As I say, I think nurses are the key for um, PD programs. And we should have nurses trained how to manage patients, how to manage complications, because they can do it very effectively. But unfortunately, throughout South Africa and the rest of Africa, nurses haven't learned much about PD. And so they're very nervous about managing it. They're quite happy to manage a patient on hemodialysis. And so we need to upskill our nursing staff. Physicians also don't see much PD and they, they're nervous of managing a patient on PD if they don't understand it. They would rather put a patient onto hemodialysis that they've, they've seen a lot of. And a lot of our registrars you know, um, go through their training um, often they, many of them will never see a patient on PD. So um, they are going to be nervous of starting the patients on, on PD and they're not necessarily going to get the best outcomes. A lot of people believe that PD is a poor modality um, because of peritonitis. And again, Abdu showed you, you know, that the high, high incidence of peritonitis and that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you have few patients on PD and um, you have poorly trained nurses and doctors managing them, then we're going to see poor outcomes and people are going to think that PD is a, is a poor modality. Also, what, what happened was that there was quite a high number of patients on PD, especially in South Africa, back in the 90s. Um, that number fell. And that was because in the 90s, patients were on the old system of Connect PD, where there was a very high peritonitis rate. With the change to a twin bag system and with a flush before fill, the peritonitis rates have fallen dramatically. And in many places, um, peritonitis um, rates are, are down. You know, patients should be getting one, one episode of peritonitis maybe every four years. So peritonitis rates can be low. Public-private partnerships have gone a long way um, against PD. In many of these public-private partnerships, it is funded by um, hemodialysis uh, providers. They're very keen to get patients onto hemodialysis and they want their chairs filled with hemodialysis patients. And so they are very anti um, the, the, 
the public sector going into peritoneal dialysis because um, that's going to take away from their revenue stream. So it does tend to be a barrier to, to PD in Africa. Remuneration, um, we see this in America, um, but we also see it in Africa, where patient, uh, doctors are paid more for a patient on, on hemodialysis than they are for a patient on PD. And if you're someone who believes that they're equivalent, or you may even feel that PD is inferior, of course, you're going to go towards the, the hemodialysis option. Surgical expertise for putting PD catheters in is a problem. Um, Often the PD catheter is inserted by the registrar who's never put a catheter in before. And if you get bad outcomes, again, your PD program tends to fall by the wayside. We have a lot of crash landers. Um, and so starting patients on dialysis, they arrive very late, often need to go into hemodialysis early. And so getting them onto PD can be a problem. And then there's this question about home circumstances and poverty. And can these patients really do um, PD, um, even if they're living in a, in a, in a poor setting. What we also need to realize though is that the there's a reality of hemodialysis in Africa. You know, we, we have this vision of, of hemodialysis as wonderful, but actually we don't have vascular surgeons. So many of our patients or very few of our patients actually get fistulas. And if they're not getting fistulas, they're going to be dialyzing through a tunneled line um, or even worse, they're going to have long-term temporary lines. In. And this is the case in more than 80% of units. Also, there's not enough dialysis slots. So in many countries, including South Africa, patients get a maximum of twice weekly dialysis. This leads to the patients becoming overloaded, frequently readmitted. Um, that's gonna add to the cost of looking after these patients, but also these patients don't do well um, and their, their survival is worse. And in many cases, um, when the patients fail because they've run out of vascular access, they then change to PD as a last resort. And these patients have lost their residual renal function. Residual renal function is very important when you're on PD. And so you've already got a failing patient going on to PD and they tend to get poorer outcomes. There's a number of benefits for PD over um, hemodialysis. It preserves vascular access. So these patients, even if they're on PD for three years, that's three years without needing um, to have a fistula. Um, which adds three years to their life at the other end. They will have better dialysis adequacy because they'll do proper PD as opposed to twice a week hemodialysis. Patients don't have to travel. That's really important in, in rural areas. You know, we, if you look at all the countries in Africa, they all offer hemodialysis, but they mostly offer it in the main, major centers, whereas the majority of people live out in rural areas. So they don't have the option of doing hemodialysis or they have to move to a center to do it. It's a cost saving for both the patient, but it is a cost saving for the state and medical aids. And we'll talk about this a bit later. There's less use of limited hemodialysis resources. Remember, um, the number of patients on hemodialysis in South Africa has not increased um, over the last five years um, in the state sector. So those numbers are you know, really, really low. Um, and if you've got more patients that you're trying to get on dialysis, PD is your only way of actually expanding your, your dialysis program. Um, and then, of course, acute PD can be used, um, especially in rural areas where patients are waiting to be transferred into the major centers for hemodialysis for acute kidney injury, and you can prevent deaths that way. So this is just looking at the population density in South Africa. And I hope my pointer comes up on the screen, but you can see in the sort of top center is, is Gauteng, very high population there, Kozilu Natal on the East Coast and the Cape. Um, those are the centers that have got a high population. But they're also the center where most the nephrologists are. And yet it's a huge country. And there's a lot of people living in pockets where there are no nephrologists um, for a two-day travel time um, to getting to, to dialysis. So certainly that's, that's a major benefit. But can we offer patients dialysis in these rural areas? Well, this is just one of my patients who lived in a, a very rural area. Um, she was actually on automated PDs. She was lucky she did have electricity out there. Um, but you can see that you can make a plan. She has water, which she keeps in a bucket, which is purified, washes her hands with that, um, using gel, alcohol gel or spray, and you can get very good outcomes. And despite very rural areas, we've managed to keep peritonitis rates as good as we had in the UK um, in my unit. As I say, you want to weigh up uh, twice weekly dialysis through a tunnel dialysis line 
um, or a temporary line versus peritoneal dialysis at home in a rural area. So it may be slightly suboptimal out in, that, in those poor circumstances, but it may still be better than what they have as the other option. If you're setting up a PD program, you do need to show that costs are either equal um, or a cheaper alternative to HD, otherwise your um, administrators are not gonna be that interested. But there are cost benefits which aren't included in the price of PD. So often people look at the cost of the PD consumables versus the cost of hemodialysis, but they don't take into account the nursing requirement. We've shown that you need one is to four um, nurses for hemodialysis, whereas we have one is to 14 or even less for PD. There's a lower transport cost if the hospital is bringing patients in for dialysis, but also that's a lower cost for patients if they're paying for their own transport. Um, if the patients are dialyzed adequately and they're not getting pulmonary edema, they're not going to need to be admitted. There's a significantly lower EPO requirement in patients on PD compared to hemo. If the patients are dialyzing with temporary lines or tunneled lines, there's a lower cost because you're not having to replace those all the time. And certainly acute PD is cheaper than hemofiltration, so in the acute setting, it's cheaper. But for patients, there's a benefit. They have a, they're in a better financial situation, um, especially if they are working. Um, and often these patients are the breadwinner for a large extended family. And so if they can keep working, it makes a huge benefit to the whole community, not just the patient. So there are a few studies looking at, at cost effectiveness, and this is taken from the, the UK, showing that if they went um, to a PD first program, they would save on average three to 6,000 pounds per patient per year. Um, this is looking at the US and looking at per person per year expenditure. And you can see the cost of PD is significantly lower than, than hemodialysis. And this is a study out of Japan, again, showing around about a $4,000 um, decrease in cost per year um, compared to, to hemodialysis. What about patients? Employment, as I say, is really important. And there are three studies that showed that patients on PD um, have higher employment than patients on hemodialysis. You do need to take this with a pinch of salt because patients who went on to PD in most of these studies are often younger patients. So these are patients that may be more likely to work, but certainly it does allow them the opportunity of working. What about quality of life? Um, so this is taken from the PDOP study. This is about 2,700 patients. And these are all PD patients who are asked um, about benefits and um, whether they felt PD was an advantage or a disadvantage along a number of um, questions um, compared to hemodialysis. And then they were ranked, if they were above, above one or two, then it was obviously advantageous over PD, over hemodialysis. If they were less than zero, then they felt that, that um, <coughs> sorry, PD was less advantageous than and hemodialysis from a quality of life point of view. And you can see in the US, the UK on the right, and Australia, New Zealand, and Canada on the left, um, that there was a, a very high proportion, around 80%, um, who were definitely in there. It was an advantage to be on PD compared to hemodialysis. In Thailand, however, um, those numbers weren't quite the same. Now, what's the difference? Well, Thailand have a PD first program. And so all patients have to do um, have to do PD and um, they won't be funded if they if they want to do hemodialysis and they don't have a contraindication and so there you're taking more of a population who of, of the whole group and you can see that there's around about a 50 50 split as to those that feel that um, PD is an advantage from a quality of life point of view compared to the others so it's around 50 50. Here you can see just the questions that people were asked um, and where they felt there was a major advantage um, receiving treatment at home, don't have access to blood, um, patients are in charge of their own treatment, um, they're responsible for their treatment, they can perform their treatment at night, they get flexibility when they start their treatment, and that's really important, is that PD is a flexible treatment. So if the patient is working, they can do PD before they go to work, they can do it when they come home, um, it's hard to fit it in, but they, they can do it. If they have a scheduled shift in a state hospital, they will definitely lose at least one day of their, their week to dialysis because of, of time. So the benefits, are they can be treated at home. They've got more freedom with their diet and fluid. Um, they don't have a restriction on potassium. Um, if they've got residual renal function, they can drink what they like. 
They have an ability to travel. They don't have the transport issues of having to get into dialysis. They don't get post-dialysis lethargy and, as I say, more able to continue work. But there are benefits to hemodialysis. Certainly patients burn out on PD. They get tired of doing PD. They've got four free days and they've got more space at home. And that more space at home is a major thing when you look at these quality of life um, questions. And here you can see one of my patients who um, shows you just you know, what an impact it does to have all of these boxes um, in your lounge because that's where the only place that you can store them. There are seven studies looking at quality of life and um, all but two showed significantly better quality of life scores for, for PD and hemo. And certainly uh, there's a number of patients. This is a patient of mine in the UK showing that you, know, you can have a good quality of life with PD, you can travel. This is another patient in South Africa going on a, a three week camping holiday around, around um, Botswana. Um, again, um, shows a better quality of life, but these are all first world problems. What's actually the case with our patients? These are two of my patients in, in, um, from Peter Maritzburg. And when we set up the PD program there, um, both of these patients were desperate to be on PD. Why? Because they would have to spend two days traveling to and from dialysis each time. So they would spend um, six days of their week dialyzing and one day at home. And so for them, quality of life was that actually they could be at home. And that's really important in Africa. And this is a study out of Colombia, and this is a very rural area. Um, and they just showed that their the patient technique and patient survival was really, really high. And why was that? Well, these patients, if they didn't do PD, they would have to go either to the center in, in Bogota, or they wouldn't be able to do dialysis. So certainly for these patients, um, they, need to do, they need to do PD for their, their, to, so that they can live at home. This is a study that came out of Stellenbosch um, from Elia Tano and Razine David's group. And they compared their PD and hemodialysis patients and did um, quality of life scores. They did show that their symptom management was better um, in hemodialysis patients compared to PD patients. However, more patients on PD were working. Sleep was better in the, in the hemodialysis patients, but dialysis staff encouragement was felt to be better in PD. But if you looked at the overall quality of life scores, there was not much difference between the two groups. So quality of life in an African setting is probably equivalent. In the interest of time, I'm gonna speed up a little bit, but just looking at residual renal function, that's really important for our patients, especially if they're not getting a lot of dialysis, especially if they don't have access to three times a week hemodialysis where they can get rid of fluid um, or they can't have access to APD. We want to preserve the residual, residual renal function as long as possible. And there's a number of studies, including the study from, which was comparative from the NECASIP group in, um, in Holland, showing that residual renal function fell significantly slower on PD compared to hemodialysis. There's also the problem of hemodialysis causes um, myocardial perfusion defects. This is Chris McIntyre's work with their MRI patients on dialysis, showing that these patients developed regional blood flow abnormalities in their heart when they dialyzed, um, and this caused myocardial stunning. Myocardial stunning is significantly associated with increased mortality, but they showed that PD patients don't get this myocardial stunning. So certainly it may be beneficial from that perspective. Also infections, it was always a problem with PD peritonitis, um, but those numbers have fallen. This is taken from US registry, and you can see the number of patients getting peritonitis has gone down significantly, whereas on hemodialysis, actually the infection rates are going up because of the use of dialysis lines, and that's what we see as well. In terms of survival, there's been a significant reduction in survival in patients on PD compared to hemodialysis over the years. And this is because we understand fluid balance better, our peritonitis rates are going down, and so PD is becoming a much better uh, modality. And you can see again from the US registry that the survival in patients uh, or the mortality in patients in the bottom square, square is going down significantly faster than hemodialysis. This is a study, um, again, looking at um, patients in Denmark, but they, you can see that in two cohorts between 1990 and 1999, peritonitis um, mortality um, went down significantly, whereas it was unchanged in hemodialysis. So we understand PD better. And I'll show you data later showing that if your center understands PD better, your outcomes get better. This is from Canada showing that 
for the first two years, your survival is better on PD, it then averages out over time. Um, again, showing that in, in earlier days, actually after two years, you were better off on hemodialysis, whereas in the latest cohort, 2001 to 2004, actually it's equivalent after three years. So this is usually when patients have lost their residual renal function. This is a study um, out, of, out of Holland showing um, survival, not significantly different between the two groups, but there is a concern about patients who are older with comorbidities, especially diabetes, that these patients may not do as well as patients on hemodialysis. This may be related to the uh, lack of being ability to control fluid balance, but it might also have something to do with the glucose exposure to these patients, and the jury is out. In developing countries, this is from Colombia, showing that patients, even though they had higher rates of, of um, diabetes, had significantly better, uh, had better um, survival, um, albeit not significant, um, in patients on PD compared to hemodialysis. And finally, this is a, a matched scoring system from the US, again showing over the first three years that PD um, had better survival compared to hemodialysis. But Jane Bogman um, wrote this editorial, and I think it's really important. It's, it's really a, a question of who cares, okay? PD is probably equivalent to hemodialysis. There may be a survival advantage in the first few years, but really they are equivalent. So it doesn't, we shouldn't go, keep trying to prove one is better than the other. They're probably about as good as each other. We need to look at what's gonna work best for the patient in terms of quality of life, what we're able to offer, how we're able to expand our program. And what you also need to think about is that our patients in Africa, although we would want them to go from CKD to dialysis to transplant, most of these patients won't be transplanted. So these patients are going to be dial on dialysis for the rest of their life. And if we're going to have to use PD and hemodialysis together, we're much better off using PD in the first instance when the patients have residual renal function, preserve their vascular access, and then move them on to hemodialysis later because they don't do as well if they do PD after hemo. And this brings us back to this integrated care scenario. This is um, proposed by Ram Gokul a number of years ago but suggesting that patients should start on peritoneal dialysis when they've got residual renal function, and then they move later on to hemodialysis or preferably transplantation. And there's a small study out of Belgium from Lynn van Biesen's group showing that those patients who have this integrated care approach compared to those that start on hemodialysis from the beginning have a better survival um, compared to those started on hemodialysis. And the European best practice guidelines suggest that a PD first approach should be presented to patients as the most logical choice. Um, again, our patients don't often have choice. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit quickly about these PD first policies. So this is um, in Thailand. In Thailand, they decided to go for a PD first policy. And what you can see from here is that the number of patients on PD rose dramatically over from 2007 to 2011. But the number of PD units actually didn't really change much. And what they were able to do is they're actually able to expand numbers. So the number of patients on hemodialysis didn't really change, um, but the numbers of patients on PD went up substantially. And so if you're going to try and in increase the number of patients in your center, um, PD is really going to probably be the only way to do it. Why were they so successful? Well, they did go to government and government actually bargained for PD supplies at reduced cost. And so it meant that PD actually worked out cheaper um, so it allowed them to expand their program. And certainly they've come up with very good, very good outcomes. And you can see in terms of survival and um, very good um, five-year survivals. Um, what you can also see is that in their two cohorts, 2008 to 2012 versus two, 2013 to 2016, um, this is looking at patient survival and technique survival, technique on the left, patient on the right. You can see that they were better in the later cohort. And why was this? Well, people got used to using PD. So when you start out using PD, you may have poorer outcomes, but um, as you go on time, um, outcomes can certainly improve. And this was shown also by um, Rosine Davis group in, in Stellenbosch, showing that survival probability um, in the period 28, 2008 to 2011, 2011 to 2014, um, technique survival um, significantly improved in those patients. Um, in the later cohort. So again, once you get to know how to do PD, your outcomes are gonna be better. Nikki Wen um, and Bianca Davidson um, 
looked at their PD first program in Cape Town and also have shown that you can get very good outcomes with a PD first program. It's not ideal because there are patients who go into these programs who don't want to be on PD. They will fight against it. They will do everything they can to get onto hemodialysis. And yet, despite that, um, they have got very good survival. And if you look at this, comparing Australia, Hong Kong, New Zealand, Mexico, the countries that have the highest numbers of patients on PD, Hong Kong does have a PD first program. Um, compared to South Africa, their one-year survival was 91%, two-year survival, 79%. Um, and five-year survival, very similar to the other groups. So you can, even with a PD first program, get a good outcome. So in conclusion, PD does have significant benefits for patients in Africa. Outcomes can be excellent despite them living in a rural area and PD first policies um, will relieve, relieve your already stretched healthcare services, especially hemodialysis programs. And the last comment really is that no one said it would be easy. Don't think setting up a PD program is gonna work first time, you're going to have no cases of peritonitis, you're going to have to go through a learning curve. But don't give up because your outcomes will eventually actually be really good. Um, and you'll find that a PD program is very rewarding. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Brett, for this excellent presentation. It was very interesting and very, very informative. Um, we do have, uh, I see a question from Professor Yasser Abdel Hamid uh, from Egypt. Uh, I will read your question, uh, Professor Yasser. Uh, thank you so much for your highly comprehensive talk. Based on your experience, do you recommend to push PD as a head to head modality compared to intermittent therapies and CRRT in ICUs, not only in special settings? Professor Bett? Okay. Um, so, look, PD compared to hemodialysis um, and compared to CRT have been shown in small studies to have equivalent outcomes in patients with AKI. And certainly with COVID, even in high income countries, um, they showed excellent outcomes in patients doing PD with AKI. So um, it, it, as a head to head thing, I would say they're, they're equivalent. In an African setting, I think it is probably better. And the reason for this is that if you've got a patient who is cardiovascularly unstable, PD is going to be a better option compared to a patient on intermittent hemodialysis. So from a, if you, there's very few centers that are able to offer CRRT in the ICU. And if you are, it's extremely expensive. Compared to intermittent hemodialysis, again, you, you save on nursing resources and the, the nurses in the ICU can be trained to do acute PD. Um, and certainly we have done that. So you don't have to use your hemodialysis nurses down in the ICU. And um, so again, there's a lot of benefits for doing acute PD um, in AKI in the ICU. Um, and as I say, outcomes are, are certainly equivalent in single center studies. Interestingly, the study um, out of Abdul Awaysh's group in Saudi Arabia, where they compared, they did a um, acute PD using tidal APD compared it to CRRT and actually showed a significantly better survival in the PD group compared to the CRRT group. Um, so yes, I, I certainly think it is something to consider. Um, I think you need to have a look at what's available in your setting, um, but I think there are certain significant advantages in, in an African setting. Perfect, thank you so much. Someone else, uh, Jacqueline Shu also is having a question, but you haven't written it, Jacqueline. Can you please write your question in the chat? Boxes. Um, Professor Yasser is thanking you, uh, Brett, for your uh, answer. Uh, until Jacqueline writes her question, I, I want to ask you regarding South African private sector. You said that uh, still, despite that they're paying from their pockets, they prefer hemodialysis. And you said that administrators were controlling this choice. Can't you, nephrologists, actually guide the patients toward the choice of PD? Why are still the administrators controlling the choice? of the modality of dialysis in this uh, sector, in the private sector. Okay, I think, I think maybe I, I, I said that incorrectly. It's, it's not so much the administrators. Um, we are trying to work actually with the medical aides to, to you know, get them to, to somehow incentivize patients going on to PD so that they will be offered the choice. Unfortunately, there's a number of reasons. I, I think remuneration is a major problem. Um, and you know, there is better remuneration for hemodialysis compared to PD. But I also think in the private sector, 
you've got private dialysis units who do not want to give up their patients to, to PD. They want mm -hmm. to keep the patient in the seat. And nurses will actively discourage patients from going to PD if they've started on hemodialysis. Um, and I think that's a, that's a major problem. But I, I see large numbers of patients who have, have never been told about PD. Yes. So pre-dialysis education is important. A lot of them are crash landers. They should get education as soon as they start. Uh, and we all know that when a patient's been on, on a dialysis modality on hemo for a while, they don't want to change. So you've got to get in there early and, and explain to them about the modalities then. So that first, uh, the PD first dialysis uh, policy, I think is the answer to uh, this uh, point, I guess. Uh, Jacqueline actually posted her question, Brett. She's saying, how is storage of fluids at, um, especially in poor settings, homes managed by patients, are they given monthly supplies? This is her question. Yeah, so in South Africa, the patients do get monthly supplies, so it, it is a problem. Certainly, you can, you can store your solutions outside as long as they're on something which is keeping them off the, off the ground um, and they're covered so they're not in direct sunlight. Um, so patients can store them outside, but a lot of them have to store them inside. There have been a number of ingenious ways that patients have stored them. Um, for example, using the boxes as the base for a bed and then putting a mattress over the top of the, of the boxes. Um, patients do store them in their rooms. Um, in Thailand, what they do is they actually deliver them to the local health center, and then the patients come and collect a certain number of boxes um, you know, each week that they then take home. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm guessing there are no more questions. Uh, and they're all thanking you, Brett. Thank you so much for your time and your very nice presentation. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, now I will present our next speaker, also from South Africa. Uh, we have Dr. Bianca Davidson. Uh, Dr. Bianca uh, did her undergraduate medical training at the University of Cape Town. Uh, she graduated as a fellow uh, of, the of the College of Physicians in 2013 and completed her subspecialty training in nephrology in 2017. Uh, she has a special interest in peritoneal dialysis. We have seen one of her papers uh, in Dr. Brett's presentation, and also in transplantation and adolescent care. She did in 2015, uh, she did receive an award, a Bertha School of Business Innovations grant, and with which she did establish the adolescent renal clinic at Gruti Shure Hospital. She's very passionate about improving uh, service delivery and advocacy of patients' rights. Uh, and she dedicated her research efforts to the evaluation of local services and provide insights how outcomes can be improved upon. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Bianca, for the presentation that you're gonna give us. You're gonna talk about dealing with ultrafiltration failure and other complications of PD. Dr. Bianca. Thank you so much for the time and to the two previous speakers for excellent talks. Um, I thought I would change this talk slightly just to make it um, seem a little bit easier because I think one of the reasons that PD isn't widely offered is that if you are a young nephrologist and you, you've trained in, in a big center and you end up back in the periphery in an isolated area, sometimes it's easier to go with what you know. So I thought uh, today I would chat briefly about the complications on, um, on PD and how, to, uh, um, and how to troubleshoot them to make it a little bit less scary for the provider that will be seeing all, um, the, um, the, the complications. So I'd like to um, talk not about uh, problems, but about, um, but about solutions. And the first one that we're gonna deal with is what is normal? So um, really what you can see here is a X-ray of a, of a patient. You can see the PD catheter, you can see my little arrow and this tip of the catheter sitting nicely within the pelvis. So it's always good to, to, um, to start out knowing what, what, a, what a normal X-ray looks like. The complications that we will chat about um, today are inflow, outflow problems, migration of the catheter, what happens if you have a leak or, um, or, uh, or hernia, infective problems, and, um, and ultrafiltration failure. I'd like to start out by chatting about inflow, outflow problems. So these are patients that will come into your office and say to you, the bag is going in, but not all of it is coming out. Or if they're on APD, they're going to say, doctor, this machine is just keeps alarming, I'm not sure why, or even worse, they're gonna come in and say, I can't get the bag in, it's just not flowing in. 
So once again, before you start dealing with problems, good to know what what uh, what normal looks like. So under normal circumstances, a two liter bag should drain and it should take about 15 minutes and usually takes about 20 minutes to for uh, for the patient to to then drain that bag out once again different different patients have different time um time uh, time lengths and patients will start to get a feel of what is their normal time to um to to drain a bag and and uh, we need to listen when patients are coming in and saying that um drainage is a, is taking longer so what is the cause of this in, um, inflow problem? And I thought I would tackle each of these problems by, um, by having a little bit of a quiz. So a 33-year-old female recently started on PD, sees her, her, um, her gynecologist within the last month complaining of heavy menstrual bleeding. The gynecologist starts her on, uh, on cyclocapron and she comes in and she brings a bag and says to you, doctor, this was in the bag and, and, my, and the fluid is no longer draining in. So is this problem because of cyclocaprone causing fibrin clots? Is this a worm? Is this a gynecological problem or has the PD catheter um, migrated? So what we did is we would do the same workup with, um, with each patient is we sent the patient for a x-ray to have a look and see if the PD catheter was, uh, was in the right place. We had a look at the bag and that definitely wasn't the worm. And what we found was that the, the, um, the cyclic capron was precipitating fibrin clots. We actualized the, the, um, the, um, the port and we contacted the gynecologist to, uh, to um, stop the cyclocapron and look for an alternative method for um, for uh, for family planning. The patient has done well and is still doing well on um, on PD. So the next case, similar case with a slightly different slant, 33-year-old female recently started on, um, on PD, sees her gynecologist within the last month complaining of heavy, uh, of heavy menstrual period. She now comes in with the, with the same complaint of the bag is not flowing, flowing in. So um, if you have a look here and you can see, what you will notice is that the PD catheter, we've done the X-ray, the PD catheter is nicely in its spot. So it doesn't look like this catheter has, um, has, uh, has, 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 has migrated. We took a drug history. There was no cy um, cyclocaprin in there. The bag was actually clear. So when we looked at the different options, was this um, cyclocapron? The answer was no. This, this was definitely, there were no fibrin-like um, deposits within the bag. There was no gynecological problems that we could note. And there was, no, there, there was no migration of the catheter. At this point, we ended up asking our, um, our, our surgeons to go in with a laparoscope to have a look. And um, indeed, she, uh, she did have a, a gynecological problem. And sometimes in, uh, in rare cases, fimbre or um, ovary can wrap around the PD tube and end up blocking it. And that was what had happened in this case. We've also, when you run into inflow outflow problems, if you've treated all of, all of the medical causes, you can very um, occasionally get um, omentum that is uh, stuck around the catheter. And this once, uh, once again, your um, surgeon within, within the area can, um, can quite confidently fix. So the common problems for inflow outflow problems are constipation, adhesions, and blood clots or, or, or fibrin. And I had briefly mentioned before that if you are worried about fibrin, you can actylase the line. And um, sometimes you can even add heparin in with, um, with each bag. So we've chatted about the inflow outflow problems, and I'm hoping that now when you see um, a patient that is complaining of this, if you do do PD, you feel a little bit more confident in, um, in managing the problem. So one of the options we had in the previous cases was, what do you do if your catheter has, um, has, um, has migrated? So this next um, slide is asking you, what is your uh, um, approach to a PD patient that has the following um, abdominal x-ray? So this patient came in with exactly the same um, complaint, either their bag was not draining in or which was taking a long time to drain out. And what you notice here is that the catheter is not curling around into the pelvis. You can see the, the, um, the coil of it up close to the um, uh, first lumbar, lumbar spine. And if you, uh, the first question is why did the catheter do that and what is the cause? And uh, I think we can all um, appreciate from that abdominal x-ray that there's quite a lot of fecal loading. 
So constipation is a problem, but it's not an unfixable problem. And we quite often see it in, um, in patients with, um, with, uh, with PD because of their phosphate binders, because of the reduced fluids, possibly because of lack of, uh, lack of, lack of motility. And what we do is we will give all of our patients a chronic script of um, of lactulose, so we manage bowel um, bowel habits in uh, in uh, in uh, in all of our PD patients to help try try to avoid catheter problems. And if there is a problem with um, with constipation, our sisters are very avid users of um, of fleet enemas that will um, help the patients to uh, clear out their constipation. So a very manageable um, solution. If your PD catheter doesn't re relocate down with peristalsis after the bowels um, are cleared, you um, unfortunately do then need to get your surgeon um, involved to uh, recite the catheter. The next complication that we'll talk about are leaks and hernias. So because you are placing um, peri peritoneal fluid within the abdomen, there's increased pressure. Often this is due to the volume of the fluid. Um, uh, uh, we all know that, that hernias can, uh, can often be caused by coughing, lifting, straining, and they are associated with age and a raised BM uh, BMI. It's, um, they can, this can be a relatively common finding. And if you have a patient um, complaining of a lump or swelling within the groin area or the abdomen, just have a careful look to make, to, uh, to make sure that they haven't developed hernia. So, the, what, so the, uh, the question I would like to ask you in this presentation is what do you do if you find a patient that has this? They've just started on PD. You can see on the top um, left-hand side that they've got the, um, the uh, exit site that is sitting there and is now coming, um, coming in with a, with, a, with a groin swelling. Um, and the management of this is really to try and prevent it before but, um, before it starts. So before you start anybody on um, on PD, have have a good look. Ask them to stand up. Ask them to cough. Look at their groin. Look for any visible hernias that you can fix before they start PD. So that would be the first point point uh, point of advice. And then uh, the second point is that if you do develop um, a hernia, this is uh, very unlikely to settle on its own with the with the fluid that has been, that is getting um, instilled. So we would advise a surgical a repair and a brief rest on um, on HD while this is uh, while this is healing. Uh, after that, you can re you can recommence um, PD initially um, with uh, with lower volumes to um, to start the patient on the on the dialysis again. Uh, genital swelling can uh, can sometimes occur, and once again, that that is that is often due to um, hernia or uh, patent um, processes vag uh, vaginalis. It's very distressing to uh, to patients. It is fixable, and you can continue with with your peritoneal dialysis afterwards. Often, these hernias can become quite uh, quite large and will need a replacement with um, mesh and uh, and surgical fix, but um, it is doable. And then do all of these leaks happen on the outside? And the honest answer is no. So how do you tackle this? A 42-year-old male recently started on, uh, on PD progressively in uh, increasing shortness of, uh, of breath. You examine them. They've got dullness to percussion on the right-hand side. You do the chest x-ray and it looks like there is an, um, an effusion on, on the right. And they started PD a couple of weeks ago. How do you work this up? And what do you do with this finding? So what you would do is you would do exactly the same as you would do for any patient that has a, um, a pleural uh, effusion. You'll tap it and you'll send it um, away. And what you're definitely in, uh, interested in is to look at um, the comparison between the glucose of the fluid and, and, the, and the glucose of the patient to see if, it, if, it, if it's higher than, 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 than what you would uh, um, expect, which would then uh, lead you to think that this is um, a leak. Uh, often uh, leaks is, are just because of a congenital or um, acquired uh, di uh, diaphragmatic defect into the pleural space, and um, sadly, this often does uh, require patients to then be switched to um, to HD. And from memory, I think in the last seven years, I can think of only one one uh, one patient that we have had that has um, that has required this. Okay, so we've now chatted about the inflow outflow problems. We've spoken a little bit about migration and managing your constipation and your bowel habits. We've spoken a little bit about leaks and, and hernias and how important it is to check your patients before you start, and that all of these problems so far are very um, are very are, uh, are very are very fixable. So the next um, thing that we'll just chat briefly about because it will be covered tomorrow by um, Professor Verne is um, infective problems, and uh, we often call it the bench of doom 
room where all of the patients sit waiting, waiting for hemodialysis within our unit on a long bench. And if you have a, a, a prospective PD patient that sits on, uh, on the bench, they will get turned against PD uh, quickly because patients will say, no, you will, you will, you will, you will get a peritonitis, which um, is not always true because we have a lot of patients that, um, that don't, but, uh, peri but peritonitis seems to be one of the major concerns of, um, of uh, nephrologists and patients heading, um, heading into PD. So if you have a patient um, that is starting PD, you will often tell them that um, we educate all, all of our patients in a two week program, but, but the golden rule with peritonitis is you need to be able to read the, read the newspaper below, the, um, below your, um, your PD bag. So you can see in, um, in diagram A, a nice clear, clean, um, clean bag and diagram B is a very extreme um, example of a cloudy bag that you are unable to read through. And if you develop the peritonitis, you need to come back sooner so that treatment can be um, can be started. I'm not going to cover this in um, in uh, in detail now. I just wanted to give you an uh, example of what our protocol looks like. So, um, Professor Vernon and um, myself uh, did a one-page uh, protocol that we have on the board in the unit in the student area in the registrar area, and it's a one-page um, sim simplified version that um, junior doctors can then use to uh, to confidently treat peri uh, peri um, uh, peritonitis when it when it does present in after hours, and um, this is a very manageable. Com, uh, um, com, uh, complication of PD, all, uh, albeit not a nice one for the for the patient. All right, so finally we're going to get to ultrafiltration prob, um, failure, which once again is is a very manageable um, complication of, uh, of of PD. So what you would ideally like is a PD patient that doesn't have any fluid fluid overload. But what do you do if you have somebody who comes in with edema? a high BP, they've gained a lot of weight quickly. Um, they have, you, you have to use excessive amounts of hypertonic saline. So you're using a lot of 4.5% glucose blags. What do you do with, uh, with, a, with a patient that you're just struggling to, um, to control um, the fluid management of? And what you, when you clinically um, assess them, you definitely feel that they are, 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 are retaining fluid. So what we're going to go through now is just the uh, the brief al um, algorithm to how to think uh, how to think through this problem. And the first step is to uh, make sure you don't have any mechanical problems. So you're going to check whether there's any inflow outflow problems. You're going to do an X-ray and check that your catheter is in the right place. You're going to make sure that there's no hernias um, there. You're going to have a look at the chest X-ray to make sure that there aren't any um, any leaks. After you have done that and excluded that there's no mechanical problem, you're going to have a look at this, at this problem in two different phases. Is this a patient-related problem, uh, meaning that there's good ultrafiltration, but your patient is still volume overloaded, or is this a PD-related problem? So in our setting, this is where we would use, um, use a PET test, and I'm very aware that a lot of you that are listening to this talk won't have access to PET tests, so we will um, we'll chat about um, a poor man's PET test and what we've done in our unit to try and troubleshoot not having to use um, a PET test within the clinical setting. So firstly, if you're seeing the patient and they're coming to your room and they're always overloaded, ask them to do a bag exchange and have a look and see how much is coming out of the bag. If they've got good ultrafiltration, meaning that you put two liters in and you're getting three liters out, um, it's unlikely to be ultrafiltration problem. And then you have to go through your, um, your checklist of whether this is a patient related problem. Are they doing all of their bags? Do they have residual renal function? Are they restricting fluid and, um, and, uh, and salt? There's no point in doing bag exchanges and trying to ultrafiltrate if you're drinking three, uh, three liters of water a day and you don't have any urine, urine output. Um, optimizing sugar is one of the biggest things. So if you have uh, if you have diabetic patients, you're going to want to control the sugar so that because you you uh, you're getting dialyzed with an osmotic gradient with the glucose solutions that you are putting in. And one of the biggest ones is are your patients draining all of their bag out or are they um, stopping that um, that that outflow early? 
So if you, uh, if this is, I just want to go for one second through through the PET test, just, just so that if you hear about the PET and you're not sure what it uh, what it is, it's one of the tests that we do to have a look and see how much renal clearance you have and how much PD clearance you have and what your transporter status of your of your of your of your membrane is. And it's quite a cumbersome test. You have to ask your patients to bring all of their effluent from 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 the day before in, so 24 hours worth of bags drained, and they'd usually come in with their gym bag and it's very uncomfortable because they have to take the public transport in with it and on the morning of that um, appointment the sister will then do a bag exchange with a 2.27 percent bag leave the bag in for um for uh for four hours and drain it out the four hour bag is going to tell you what the transporter status of the patient is high or low and the 24 hour bag is going to tell you how much clearance is done with the with the with the ultrafiltration they also have to collect all of their urine for 24 hours and it'll tell you how much clearance is happening with the with the urine as well it's a very useful test if you have access to it so on strict definition if you are not draining more than 750 mils over 24 hours you have ultrafiltration failure so just to take you through the through the stepwise approach, you've excluded a, a mechanical reason. You've then gone down and looked at patient related factors. You're very happy it's not a patient related problem. This is a PD related problem. This patient is putting all of their bags in. They're fluid restricting. They've got they're they they're, they're not drinking too much fluid. They're draining the bag to to completion, and they are not getting a lot of um of ultrafiltration out. This is the place where your PET test becomes very, um, very, um, very, very useful because you will be able to then tell whether this uh, patient is a fast trans a fast transporter or or a or a slow transporter. So what that means is it will give you a gauge as to how quickly the patient is passing glucose and waste across the membrane, because if they pass it quickly, quickly you, uh, you reach equilibrium quickly and then you start to retain um, fluid and, um, and glucose back into the body. So I'm sure some some of you are sitting there and saying, well, that's great, but what do I do if I don't have a um, have a PET test? You do it the cheap man's PET, which is you bring the patient in, and we often do this. You bring the patient in, uh, into the unit, you ask them to do their bag exchanges with the sister. The sister will will um, will weigh the bag um, as they're putting it in and afterwards, and give you a gauge of what the ultrafiltration volume is with um with each of the bags. The following day, before the patient or the next day. The patient will then weigh what their what their what their overnight bag is. Often, if you are getting told that um, the daytime exchanges are fine, but in the morning when they wake up after a nighttime dwell, there's this um, they are retaining fluid or they're getting very very little out. You need to worry that this patient is a is a high transporter. So high transporters, you need to decrease the time that the bag is in. So with, with CAPD, you will make them sleep dry. You decrease the time that the bag is in. And APD, you will um, increase the, uh, the number of cycles and shorten the time. If you're a slow transporter, it takes you a long time to move the waste across. You will ultrafiltrate right up to the end of that bag dwell. And in those patients, you will opt to then leave the bag in longer and let all the, all the ultrafiltration happen. And the problem, uh, and go to higher concentrations of glucose. And often in this setting and in the high transporter, we might opt for, for um, specialized fluids. So my last note is some of the findings that you'll find in PD are normal. So you may see blood that's often usual if you have endometriosis in, um, in females um, and they're varying colors of what normal can and um, can actually look like. And if you are functioning in the periphery and you don't have a center, um, there are reference guides that you can have a look at to see what normal PD looks like and what the options are if the bags are looking slightly different. So my last note that I just want to end with is that these are the common complications. All of them have got a solution to them. And um, I hope that that makes PD a little bit less scary for you to practice where, um, uh, where you are. And there are lots of PD lovers like, uh, like us that you can always phone if you run, run into trouble. Thank you so much, Professor Bianca, for this uh, very, very interesting uh, presentation. It was really nice. And thank you for just making it perfectly on time, 20 minutes. You mm -hmm. did the record today. Um, 
I, I can't see any questions so far. Uh, I just wanted to ask about what is about your experience regarding using the bioimpedance machines for assessing the fluid status of patients. Do you think it's useful? We have contradictory papers, some pro and some against. What is your personal experience? I think I use them in the setting of where we are struggling. I don't have a scientific answer for you, but often I find in young, um, young patients, we often will underestimate the um, amount of fluid that they have um, that's sitting within their tissue. And we have often been surprised at what our clinical judgment is versus what the, um, what the BCM shows. So I think in certain cases where you are struggling, especially patients with heart failure, patients where you need to keep their fluid balance good because of diastolic dis uh, dysfunction. It's a useful add-on test. I wouldn't rely on it solely. Thank you so Next. much. Thank you. No, I was actually just going to say, uh, mention the, uh, get you to talk about the adolescents because we do, that is the one time, that is the one cohort where we actually do tend to do them more frequently and be surprised as Bianca said um, at how overloaded they are um, on with their with their fluids. Yeah. And just one quick note on that. Um, we are very pro PD in adolescent um, age groups. So if you are at school or if you are studying, we will offer a, um, APD if there's electricity within the uh, within the home dwelling. We have lots of young people that are on PD and they do exceptionally well. I mean, it gives them a flexibility that you wouldn't have. Um, so you get to go on your date on Saturday. You get a, if you're doing well, you get a free day and there's no young person that doesn't want to feel normal for 24 hours. So it's a very good flexibility and modality for that. Uh, there is a question from Professor Mazhar uh, Amirali. Um, Professor Mazhar is telling you, thank you for that nice presentation, Bianca. Can pleural diseases be considered in patients on peritoneal dialysis with hydrothorax? Thank you to talk about that. So um, I don't think uh, in our setting where we have so much TB, we will obviously part of pleural diseases will be part of the differential when we'll see a, um, a hydrothorax. And when we tap the patient, we'll, we will always send off to exclude TB and, uh, and other diseases. And like I said, it's quite a rare complication that we've seen out of my memory alone. And Nikki can um, confirm, but I can only remember one, one patient that we had that had a leak and she was devastated to have to leave PD. Um, and she got switched to hemodialysis and is doing well. I will say one thing that we, there probably been a few more, not so many more, but I will say that my experience with pleurodesis has been a very painful experience. Um, for the patient. Brett might have more um, experience, but after I did it I, I with that one patient, I actually haven't done it again because it was quite, it was very painful for that patient. Apologies, I, I heard pleural disease and not uh, pleuro, uh, pleuro, pleurodesis. Sorry about that. Yeah, I have, a, I have done pleurodesis before. It, it is very painful. Um, and so the patient really needs to want to do PD, I think, to to warrant it, but I have had patients who have been desperate to stay on PD, so so have used it um, on a few occasions. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't think there are uh, any more questions. Um, please, please, Rashida. Yes, yes, I do. Please. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bianca, for your uh, your nice presentation. I would like uh, to ask about uh, the PET test. Uh, do you realize, uh, realize PET test, uh, PET test, and uh, sometimes some team are facing some problem to to do that uh, PET test. And can you propose an alternative uh, for that? That is an excellent question. We walked this road with our laboratory as, um, as well. So we didn't have PET tests when we started out and we um, eventually ended up sitting with the lab and going through how to create the test, the, um, the PET test with them. So PET tests are not always um, available and we only had a regular access to it probably for the last five, um, five six years. Um, I think that um, it might be old school, but weighing the bags and doing a bag exchange with your sister and the, and, and the patient 
patient, almost like a, a, a directly observed treatment. So you have a good gauge as to how much ultrafiltration is coming out is a very, very useful test. Um, having a look and seeing how much fluid is draining with the longer dwell the next day is a very useful test. Um, and then clinically, um, you will know whether your um, adequacy- uh, what, is what do you think about uh, to use a, a pay over the uh... Sorry, I can't, uh, you were cutting out. I can't hear the rest of that question. Uh, the, 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 the principle of using the P over D, uh, uh, criterion. Sure, I think that you might have more experience with that than, um, than me. Um, what would you advise? I don't have any we've used pets. Mm -hmm. Brett? Uh, yeah, no, I think, I, I think your, your point's great, Abdul. Many places can't do, you know, especially the, the time zero creatinine on the fluid um, yeah. and, and doing the, the glucose. Um, mm -hmm. So if, if, if there's a cost differential, I think you can still get a fair amount of, of information by doing mm -hmm. a two hour, so do a two hour creatinine, serum mm -hmm. creatinine and a, and a four hour yeah. fluid creatinine and look at the mm -hmm. DOVP creatinine. I think you yeah. get you probably get enough clinical information from that. You can't track mm -hmm. a patient. You can't, you know, if you're going to be monitoring your patients for for membrane failure, I don't think mm -hmm. you can do that. But when you've got a patient who's not ultra filtering well, and you're trying mm -hmm. to distinguish between is this patient got a mechanical complication or a leak, or have they got just a, a high transporter or fast transporter membrane? I think it yeah. is very helpful to do that. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, thank you. I'm going to take another question um, from Professor Faisal Jaraya, who's also with us in the PDK committee. Uh, Professor Faisal uh, is also thanking you for the excellent presentation. And the question for all is, do you think that PD should be a first policy in Africa? What do you think? Uh, I think yes. That's my vote for that one. We we have a PD first policy at our hospital, and I must say it, we we strongly advocate for um, PD, and it's got a lot of advantages with limited HD. So my my answer to that would be yes. Um, Professor Abdul, Brett, what do you think? I think Nikki, you can go first. Um, mm -hmm. I I am a very big advocate for PD first. My only concern is that there are certain patients that we set up to fail. So I think we need to try to uh, learn how to identify those patients that are not going to do well and not persevere once we are struggling with that patient. So I, you know, I do advocate for a PD first program. I certainly support it and we run that program, but I, there are a subgroup of patients and I, I'd like to say for me um, that I find young adolescent, young men particularly are pretty, quite problematic and, and also we also struggle with our diabetics and I know other places aren't, haven't done so badly. So perhaps yes, with a few caveats and we need to understand better those that aren't going to do well on PD and early switch. Stating the patient, I guess. Um, yes. Brett, Brett, what's up your opinion? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with Nikki. I do think a, a PD first policy, I think it's, it's important for Africa. It's the only way we're gonna get expansion of our programs. But again, agree with Nikki that, that you've got to identify those patients who are failing and move them over. And I think, um, you know, they, it's quite hard to identify those patients at the outset. There's some patients you think will actually be great patients and they do very badly and other patients who you think will do badly and do very well. So, so I think starting with a PD first policy, that's great. I think also if you are going to start with a PD first policy, make sure that you've got a a, a, a decent PD program, you know, set up. Make sure that you've got all the things in place when you're setting it up. Otherwise, again, you start a PD first program and it fails, and then you go, well, that's, look, that didn't work. Let's just go to hemo. So mm -hmm. I think it's it's important to you know to have everything in place. Um, but yes, I agree. Actually, yes, many uh, questions. Uh, Yes, yes, Russia. My, my my opinion is absolutely um, pro uh, PD first policy, but uh, as you know, we have many challenges 
uh, before making that possible in all of the Africa. Uh, I think uh, the problem is the cost it is something very important we must deal with before uh, building a, a PD first program. And uh, I'm sure also any, uh, every patient uh, cannot benefit of uh, PD. So uh, we must have a, a different situation to face and uh, to choose uh, which is a better patient for this technique. Thank you. Yes, choice of patient. Yeah, thank you. We have a few other questions. We have a very active yeah. um, um Okay, very rapid answers if possible. Um, is it important to evaluate the peritoneal pressure by Dr. Uh, Professor or Dr. Beatrice uh, Motu? Uh, Bianca? I'm not understanding the question. Is it important to examine the what? Evaluate the peritoneal pressure. Maybe she means pressure. I don't know. Yes, the pressure. Mm -hmm. pressure. The pressure uh, the... We don't. We don't routinely do that. We will. Um, mm -hmm. We have. A, we'll. Get, we will adjust. So usually, we will use a size of bag appropriate for the size of the patient. We have a quite a quite a standard um, pres uh, prescription, but we do usually look for um, signs of hernias before starting. So we don't usually do that. Next, and, and Jacqueline, she is asking: uh, Are APD machines bought by the patients? Are APD machines bought? Was that the are question? they bought? But do they pay for the machines? Yes. No. Um, sorry, we have a limited supply of APD machines. Um, so we have a limited supply of them that is paid by our state um, hospital. Uh, our dialysis is rationed. So there's a, a, we have a certain slot or amount of PD um, that is available and, and quite a small section of that is APD and you have to be working or be a school going person uh, or studying to be eligible for um, APD so in, in the state sector no in, in um, private um, I'm not quite sure Brett, Brett can maybe answer that question. Cool. Just a one, one and just a little bit extra on that the, the company actually gives us the machines so we actually yep. get the machines for free. It's the cassettes that we actually pay for. So um, yeah, so there that that is the caveat with the machines. Perfect. Uh, final it's, question. Uh, it's the same in Senegal. It is a team. Sorry, uh, Russia. Yes, go ahead, go ahead Abdul. Uh, yes. Yes, I say that in uh, in Senegal, it's the PD uh, team uh, who will uh, choose uh, which patient. Uh, must uh, be on uh, APD. It's not the patient who bought the machine. Okay. Okay. So we have different perspectives in different countries. Yeah. Okay. Mm. The final question, Bianca. Um, uh, the question is: Do you recommend the use of diuretics in all patients with residual renal function on PD, even with no clear um, volume overload? So my answer to that is I would use the diure the diuretic if you were struggling with with urine output and um, and fluid overload. I wouldn't necessarily put somebody on two Lasix if they if their blood pressure was uh, was well controlled. Having said that, when you get to that stage of renal failure, usually you do have a blood pressure problem and you are fluid overloaded. So there are quite a number of our of our patients on um, on on furosemide. Um, the, we we will stop it though when your urine output drops because there's no uh, real benefit to it then. Okay, so that was the answer to Professor Yasser Abdel Hamid from Egypt. Last question, anyone has experiences with pregnancy and pre uh, peritoneal dialysis, pregnant patients? Do you have this experience, Bianca? I've um, just had my first one. That's what I was going to say. Was, oh, that's excellent. That's a coincidence. Yeah, so Bianca and I just had our first one who had a successful pregnancy. We didn't quite get to the end, but we managed it. And so I would say that, yes, we've, we've got N equals one, but we did get a successful pregnancy, I see a, a good end result. Um, I think Brett's got more experience. Brett? Actually, I, I don't. Um, <laughs> I haven't actually ever had a, had a patient um, for pregnant, thankfully. I, I got expelled from Ops and Gynae, so I'm, I'm not the one to be talking to. Okay, okay. So maybe you can present this case in the future, Nikki. Nikki and Bianca, about your first pregnant patient and PD. Yeah, interestingly, I just want to say that she didn't actually tell us. So um, it, it all came as quite a big surprise right at the end. So um, in, anyway, she managed, we managed it at the end quite well, but um, yeah. 
Well, actually, that answered the question that did you keep it on PD? Apparently, we did keep it on PD and it worked pretty well. We well, did I keep it on PD. Thank you. Well, I think now we're going to move to the next uh, talk. It was a very rich um, discussion. Um, I am honored to present our final uh, speaker in today's webinar, uh, Dr. Patience Obiagwu from Nigeria. Uh, Dr. Patience, uh, she is an associate professor of pediatrics uh, in, the, in Nigeria, at the Bayero University, uh, and a nephrologist, of course. Uh, she, is, um, she has many certific certifications and degrees in pediatric nephrologies, health economics, and pharmacoeconomics from universities uh, and teaching hospitals in London, UK, Johannesburg, and Cape Town, South Africa, and Barcelona, and Spain. And uh, she is uh, actually very um, in, and engaged in many researches. She's currently researching into modifying practice in AKI and management, especially in resource limited settings, among other research interests. She's also passionate about peritoneal dialysis, as we're going to see right now, critical care medicine, and renal transplantation. Uh, today, uh, Professor Patients will talk about how to improvise with PD fluids if you are unable to gain access, especially in the pediatric settings. And I think this is a very interesting um, topic. Professor Patients. Hello. Um, can I be confirmed? You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for the invite and um, the previous speakers. It has really been quite interesting. I've enjoyed all the talks, well done. Um, I will make it brief and I'm supposed to be speaking on how to improvise with PD fluids. Yes, I'm a pediatrician. Um, so that, um, uh, that caveat is there. Could you move slides for me? Um, Russia, you're there? Well, I okay, just... um, this is where I work. Yeah. This is where I work at AKTH Hospital in Kano, Northern Nigeria, and that's our College of Health Sciences. Um, I've got no disclosures, although I will be speaking primarily, what my talk is on is improvised PD, and I'll be speaking in the context of acute peritoneal dialysis, not, not for chronics. Of course, previous talks have shown that, you know, for chronics you need, there's a lot more involved. So I'll be speaking on, um, the talk will be kind of directed towards acute, not chronic. So why PD? Um, Brad has earlier mentioned the reasons for PD. So I'm not going to dwell on it. However, it's important to notice that there are situations in which immediate vascular access can be difficult or impracticable, um, particularly in very small children, those with hemodynamic instability, as well as those with extensive vascular damage, although that would be more for the adults. We've had cases where people had to be moved on to peritoneal in these parts here where we don't do chronic PD um, because of um, vascular problems. And we have the complications of no local manufacturing of PD fluids, although recently there's been one company here in Nigeria, as well as for importation of PD fluids, there are very high tariffs. Um, the next slide just shows um, PD catheters, which are readily available in certain parts, not always readily available for us here. There is the one on the lowermost left, which is a rigid catheter, which can be used. However, I'm always very, I always cringe because of um, the use, there's a, there's a metallic trocar that needs to be inserted. And I, I have my um, reservations with using that because I deal with very small children and there's that risk of injury. Again, I'm in a low resource setting where you don't always have the facility of um, immediate ultrasound guidance or something to support your insertion of a catheter. Yes, we do the, um, you, we use the pill away um, kids to insert our catheters now. Previously, there was nothing to use. We could only call surgeons to insert catheters. And while I'm speaking on catheters, it's not always the, the, the regular catheters that people know the tank of catheters. People have used Foley's catheters. 
I have used nasogastric tubes. We have used chest drains. As long as something is a tube and can be gotten into the peritoneum, we have used it. Um, so um, the next slide says some contraindications to acute PD, which I wouldn't dwell on, but um, if there is an obliterated peritoneal cavity from any reason, of course, we will be hesitant to do peritoneal dialysis there. If there is an inflammatory process going on, cellulitis, burns, ileus, or if there's some reason for which catheter access will be impossible, like somebody who's had extensive abdominal surgery and high probability of adhesions, where hernia has been mentioned earlier, there could be some pleuroperitoneal connection. For these cases, we would not do PD. Um, so the ideal PD solution should be, um, that's the next slide, should be biocompatible. It should have a physiologic electrolyte and buffer composition and then a smaller agent that is non-toxic, non-immunogenic and easily metabolized. It should, be, it should produce steady, predictable osmotic ultrafiltration that is being metabolically efficient as well as being easily manufactured and cost-effective. Now that's the ideal. We have several different um, commercially produced IV, uh, PD fluids with varied characteristics, all in an attempt to get this ideal. Many parts of this continent do not have this readily available. Of course, there are a few countries, South Africa is an example, in, in Africa where um, at least you have access so ready access to some of these fluids, while some are even in trials. And over time, there have been some evolution of PD fluids, the PD solutions. Um, it has evolved over time. Initially, um, can you move the slide, please? Initially, uh, we had the high lactate fluids, which um, had acidic pH but it was found that these had detrimental effects on the peritoneum and also produced high amounts of glucose degradation products from heat sterilization and prolonged storage. Now this led to plenty of inflammation and oxidative stress. Subsequent to this, there was the multi-compartment technology type of PD fluids in which glucose is uh, put in a separate compartment at a low pH, while other components are kept at a higher, the alkaline pH, and the compartments are just mixed by kind of twisting the bag a little uh, just before use. And this led to reduction in GDPs, uh, the glucose degradation products. Subsequently, um, and even now, there are alternatives to glucose-based PD solutions that are being you know, produced in, in certain parts like icodextrin, which is being used in some places. There are places where amino acid PD solutions are used some are uh, under trial L-carnitine and the hyperbrand polyglycerol. Now here we don't have um, these available, but it's important to note that the composition of common PD solutions are, uh, the next slide, the osmotic agent, which is usually glucose to achieve ultrafiltration, the buffer, as well as electrolytes, which are kept as close to serum concentrations as possible. Um, suffice to mention that um, some ISPD guidelines on PD um, state that commercially prepared dialysis solutions are preferred. But where resources are limited, the locally prepared fluids may be used with careful observation of sterile procedures. Furthermore, it's important to use a closed delivery system with a Y connector. And where that is unavailable, an open spiking, open system with spiking of bags can be used. Now, in the case where you have to improvise, this um, is what we have to deal with because um, locally prepared foods have to, fluids have to be used. And then there are no Y connector systems that are readily available. So everybody tends to improvise by using a three-way tap, which is a source of contamination. So the locally prepared fluids, this slide shows the locally prepared fluids and their compositions. Usually there is a base fluid and there could be different additives. Um, for us here in Nigeria, and for those sites that do 
peritoneal dialysis, which is improvised, Ringer's lactate is our commonest base fluid. And that is because you don't have to, it, it, there is less mixing, not too many, um, not, not too many things to add if you're using Ringer's lactate. And the additives are usually 50% glucose to give us um, whatever strength of um, PD fluid we're trying to get to. There are sites that have plasma light, we don't have that here. Half normal saline is available, normal saline is available. And the additives could also be the antibiotics for those who want to treat peritonitis or heparin for in situations where sometimes we've got fibrin clots. There is also, um, um, France is in Tanzania, that's on the next slide. They, they, they managed a severely malnourished child with Pashioko and aneuric AKI using a combination, they used them 5% dextrose water, 750 mils of normal saline and added sodium bicarbonate, calcium gluconate, they had very good outcomes. So sometimes it's tailored to the individual patient. Now, in preparing the fluid, um, as I had mentioned, for me here, my base fluid is usually Ringer's lactate. Um, it's been mentioned, um, uh, Bianca mentioned earlier, you know, two liter fluids. There are also five liter bags, but these are the properly, pro, pro, um, the commercially um, produced fluids. Now here, if we have to improvise using intravenous fluids, many of our fluids here come as 500 mil bags. And um, sometimes as the collapsible 500 mil bag, one of which I just put in the picture there that has a medication port and the spike port. Of course, the spike port has already, already has the um, um, giving set inserted. So the other part is the medication port in which we're going to spike the bags. Now the fluid preparation, the way we do it here is um, there will be a trolley specifically prepared for peritoneal dialysis because that's what I have to teach the nurses, residents and other staff here. Aseptic measures we are taking hand washing using gloves. We first check our fluid, the Ringer's lactate and 50% that we're going to use to make up our PD solution. Check it for clarity, check expiry, the usual things we would do. And then we clean the medicated, the ports the, um, for the Ringer's lactate and 50% um, they are clean with spirit swabs. Now we insert a sterile needle into the port while another syringe is used to draw the required volume of fluids of um, glucose and inject it into the Ringer's lactate bag. Now we do not remove the needle, the needle that has been inserted into the medication port where we're going to put in our additives we do not remove that needle until we have completely injected all our additives. We try to make sure, um, it's the next slide, we try to make sure that only one puncture is done. We, do, we try not to puncture more than once in an attempt to reduce the number of touches you're going to do on a bed. Then we change, the, we shake the bag gently to mix the fluids, re-inspect our PD solution is actually ready for use at this time. And this is when the sterile spike of the IV fluid giving set or Soluset, um, also called Buretrol in some centers, you now connect that using a non-touch technique, which I showed in the next slide. We try as much as possible to avoid touching anything. Um, move the slide. Um, um, on the right, you could see that the person touching was actually touching the spike. We try not to touch as much as possible. Now, again, this is a place where um, we have very limited resources, very poor patients um, that have hardly any access to anything, no health insurance that is effective, no effective health insurance. Peritoneal dialysis is not on our health insurance. Um, we have a few sessions of hemodialysis covered by health insurance and that's it for the patient. So for our children that have acute kidney injury, we always have to improvise. We do not have access to machines or um, the, the access we have to proper fluid, the commercially available fluids, they, they are too expensive to be afforded by the patients. 
and the hospital doesn't do that because it's not under insurance. So we try to improvise and this is how we do it. This is how we try and at the same time, trying to make sure we avoid, um, we prevent infections as much as possible. So on a final note, um, we have some places in, um, some places, some centers here and also elsewhere, some IV fluid containers are provided as these semi-rigid, non-collapsible plastic bottles that have only one port. Now, if this is all one has, we still use them. And it's the same port where we spike the fluid with additives, that's the same place where we're going to put the spike and dialyze the patient. We've had quite good results because we try as much, much as possible to avoid sepsis. And so far it's been good for us. The rest of the procedure, whether prescription, frequency of exchanges, strength of solution, plus other additives, they will all depend on the clinical state of the individual patient. So this is how we improvise with peritoneal dialysis fluids. And um, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Patience, for this very nice and practical uh, presentation. From your personal experience, tell me, do you have statistics about the rates of um, infections, especially peritonitis, following uh, these uh, practical solutions to the problem that we're having in many countries in Africa? Although not published, I've, I've, uh, I've had about 30 something, 40 patients that have had um, um, improvised peritoneal dialysis. There is none for automated, of course. They've all been improvised and I've only had three that had infection confirmed peritonitis. So it, that's why I said it's been good for us. We expected more, we expected more infection, but it, it wasn't like that. And I could, I would say that it's because that's the way, that's the best way I could teach uh, my residents, um, other doctors um, to avoid infection so that we wouldn't have to treat. Many of our patients cannot even afford some of the antibiotics. So it's better for us to prevent it from happening. Excellent work and lots of passion in your work. Congratulations, Professor Patience. Thank you so much for the, the time that you did you. Uh, give us for this presentation. Is anyone having, uh, yes, there is a question. Uh, Dr. Beatrice is asking you, did you add heparin in the ringer to prevent the formation of fibrin? We do not um, add it as routine. We do not add it as routine that, you know, for every patient we're going to dialyze. So if there is a, a, a fear, and sometimes if we have, um, um, inflow, outflow issues, there is that suspicion that there may be fibrin. Again, we, we cannot look in. We don't have opportunities to scope all the time. So at that point, we add heparin to our fluids. Heparin is supposed to be a thousand units per liter. So based on whatever fluid we have, we calculate how much we put in. Okay, Brett, you have uh, something to but ask? It's not routine. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to say thank you to patients for, um, for A, for your talk, but also your ingenuity and, and doing what, you know, this is what Saving Own Lives is all about, is, is trying to, to help people, even though we may not have the, the ideal circumstances. Um, just in terms of published data, there's, there are a few studies now, there's one from Cameroon from um, one of our Saving Own Lives sites, where they compared commercially produced solutions to mixed solutions and showed peritonitis rates were equivalent. Um, from DRC, um, they used also uh, mixed fluids, um, peritonitis rates were extremely low. And Minya McCulloch's also published her data from Cape Town, um, again, showing extremely low peritonitis rates. And I think, you know, the key is, is, is what you're saying, patients, is that you, you, you've just got to do it very carefully. But if you do it very carefully, the risk of, of causing infection is exceptionally low. And, um, you know, we, we inject bags of, um, of or any of our 
our, our bags in ICU, we're injecting them all the time with drugs and with different solutions. Um, and we inject that into the bloodstream and we don't get bacteremias. So if we're using those, you know, the, the chances of, of yes. introducing infection by injecting a PD bag is exceptionally low if you're doing it carefully. So, um, and that's why the, the ISPD guidelines, we do recommend that you mix solutions yourself um, because they are life-saving. Obviously, if you've got the commercial solutions, that's better, but um, certainly it's recommended that, that we should mix them if we can. Thank you, thank you, Brad, for this addition. Uh, there are other questions, patients. Um, some uh, Dr. Salah Bashir is uh, asking, do you add calcium to uh, the solutions? Uh, patients, can you hear me? Dr. Patients? Can you hear me, Dr. Patients? Uh, Leticia, are we having a problem in the connection? Um, I think Dr. Patience has dropped off the... Okay. Okay. Very well, lucky we managed to have her as long as we did. <laughs> yes, I think we did. It's a record, Nikki. I think it's a record. Uh, well, in case Dr. Patience doesn't appear, I think... Uh, yes, it was someone speaking. No, I was just going to say, um, you can add calcium if you are using ringers, but not if you're using plasmolite or any solution that's got bicarb in it, because okay, you'll, get, you'll get a, um, a precipitation. So maybe you can, can answer the rest of the question. But, but, I, but I have to say, I would, I would ask the question as to why you're adding calcium to the PD solution. Um, it is probably much more efficient to, if someone's hypocalcemic to give that intravenously. So yeah. I, I wouldn't, we don't you know, necessarily suggest adding it. Okay, and the other question was, do you tunnel your acute PD catheters? Yeah, I do. And the reason being is they much, I find them much easier to nurse if, they, if they're tunneled, they're less likely to leak. Um, so, so yes, I would do. I, uh, in the pediatric population though, um, the pediatricians would rather not, um, and I understand that, you know, so they, they won't tunnel their, their acute PD catheters. Um, I just why, find them much easier. Why not? Um, I, I think they just, the, the children are smaller to try and create a tunnel is a little bit, a bit trickier. Um, tunneling, it, it feels a bit surgical and most of us are, are not surgeons. Yes. Um, but I, I, I certainly in adults, I think we should be tunneling them. And the ISPD guidelines are that we tunnel them. And the other advantage of tunneling them is that if this patient that arrives with a creatine of 1500 happens to be a chronic patient, they've already got their chronic PD access if you've tunneled it. So they turn out to be a, just a late presenter. Um, they, then you put your PD catheter in, it's tunneled, and you can then carry on using it. Okay. Uh, I think I'm I hope so sorry. Hold on. I'm so sorry, I got cut off. It's okay, Bishop. So sorry. Welcome, back. Just... Welcome back, dear. Okay. We have... Um, but I heard what Brett was saying. I heard okay, that. Okay, that's, um, what, <laughs> that's what matters. And you agree to what I'm sure you agree to what he said. Uh, do you mind answering the rest of the questions, patients? Yes. Um, uh, question, okay, now what's the question? The question is by Dr. Huda uh, Akrabi. She said that she had an experience with locally made fluid, but she did add safe tracks on to the bag. So I guess the question is, do you do the same? Yes, when needed, not, not um, routine. There are times when, if we're suspicious of peritonitis or some infection, sometimes it's advised, it's better. In fact, the guidelines say you do um, intraperitoneal antibiotics, okay. if we're, but not as routine. We don't do that routinely. Perfect. I didn't understand quite well the question of Miriam uh, Makanji. I got working link, thank you. I think it's just, just a comment. I will move to the next question, patients. Jacqueline Shu is asking, what okay. is the longest time that you have ever kept your patients on acute PD? Uh, my longest has been almost three weeks. I think about 18 days, 16 to 18 days. That was the longest. Okay. Yes. Okay. And we've had good recovery rate, so. Perfect, perfect. Um, mm -hmm. I think this is, um, there are no more questions. Um, 
if no one from the panel has any comment or question, I think I might uh, uh, I, I might end this excellent experience and this very, very fruitful um, webinar. I want first to thank uh, Nicola for approaching um, the PD committee and uh, starting and initi initiating this cooperation between the PD and Educational Committee of the Afran. Uh, Nikki did the, the first step and she did lots of uh, effort regarding organizing uh, the talks and uh, reaching out to the speaker in collaboration with also the PD committee. And we had also some shifts from our, our original plans. We were supposed to have an, an isolated webinar and now we joined forces with Professor Abdun Young who thankfully joined and did give a beautiful presentation and Brett as well. So uh, thank you all for the, the knowledge, for the time, for the, the spirit and the passion. Uh, I did personally enjoy it a lot. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.